This is sort of motivated by the demise of the Herschel Space Observatory, which recently came to the end of its mission, and it was orbiting in a slightly strange orbit at a thing called the L2 point. And so since we're supposed to be doing symbols here, there's a nice symbol here, L with a little subscript 2 after it, for the L for Lagrange point, and 2 because it's the second of five of these points. It's helpful to think about these things in terms of where you'd want to put satellites into orbit. And in the context of missions like uh, the Herschel Observatory, it was a, an infrared telescope, which means that you wanted to get it away from the Earth because the Earth radiates huge amounts of infrared radiation. So trying to do this science from a low Earth orbit would be really like trying to do astronomy with all the lights switched on because basically the Earth is glowing brightly in these wavelengths. So what you want to do is you want to get the satellite away from the Earth, but that law leads to all sorts of problems of its own because if you think about it for a moment, so I've got a nice cartoon view of the solar system here. I should stress absolutely not to scale. Um, things are much further apart than this, planets are much smaller. You've got the Earth going around the Sun. If we were just to take our, our satellite and launch it out into space and put it onto its own independent orbit around the Sun, that would be fine because that would keep it a reasonable distance away from the Earth. But of course the problem is the Earth and your satellite would then go around the Sun at different speeds. As you go away from the Sun because the pull of gravity gets weaker, the speed at which things orbit decreases. It's one of Kepler's laws. Um, so actually the, the satellite, if it was out here, would get left behind. And so you'd have all these problems that, you know, sometimes your Earth would be over here and the satellite would be over here and they wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. So what you want to do somehow is find an orbit which puts your satellite a decent distance away from the Earth, um, but also kind of keeps station with the Earth as the two orbit around the Sun. So a geostationary satellite is where you've got something which stays above the same point on the Earth. So if you've got the Earth orbiting, Earth rotating around, then a geostationary satellite just stays directly above the same point on the Earth because it's going around at the same speed as the Earth is rotating. This is on the bigger scale. This is where you're going around the Sun. You want your satellite to be going around the Sun at sort of the same speed that the Earth's going around the Sun. You pointed out if things are a different distance from the Sun, they have to move at different speeds. That's true. But there's a subtlety here, which is that actually what you're doing isn't the two-body problem. So the two-body problem is if you had the Sun and something in orbit around it. What you're actually doing is a three-body problem. You've got the Sun, you've got the Earth, and you've got your satellite. Now, it's a thing called the restricted three-body problem, which means you forget about the mass of the satellite compared to the mass of the Earth and the Sun. But the Earth and the Sun both have mass, and that means that they both contribute gravity. And so the force that you have to think about isn't just the force of the Sun, it's the force of the combination of the Earth's gravity and the Sun's gravity. And by putting things in just the right places, you can make those two forces conspire to keep your satellite in just the right place. For satellites like Herschel and various other of the satellites out there and the James Webb Space Telescope, which hasn't yet been launched, they're going to go to a point called the L2 point, which is out here. And this point, if you think about what the pulls of gravity is doing, the Sun is pulling you that way, the Earth is pulling you that way. So both of them are tugging you in the same direction. So the net pull on a satellite here is stronger than just the pull of the Sun. So that contributes the extra gravity you need to keep the satellite travelling at the right speed to keep up with the Earth. So it's not that far away from the Earth. I mean, even that, what I've just shown you, wasn't to scale. It's about, so the distance between the Earth and the Sun is about 150 million kilometres, and this L2 point is one and a half million kilometres, so it's like 1% of the distance to the Sun. So actually, in terms of the scale of the solar system, it's still very small, but it's sort of four times further than the Moon is from the Earth. So in terms of the scale of the, the Earth-Moon system, it's quite a long way away. So there's another point just inside the Earth's orbit called L1, where there the natural tendency would be for your object to travel faster because it's closer to the Sun, the pull of gravity is stronger, so it would kind of overtake the Earth. But now you've got the pull of gravity of the Sun that way, the pull of gravity of the Earth that way, the net effect of that is to weaken the total force on the object, which means that it travels more slowly around the Sun. So again, it will keep station with the, with the Earth as it goes around. There's kind of a subtlety here that you probably don't actually want to sit absolutely at the Lagrange point, for example, one real disadvantage of being right at the L2 point is if you think about it, if you had a satellite here, you want to have radio communications between the Earth and your satellite, but every time there's a solar flare which gives out radio waves, that's going to interfere with your communications. So you don't really want to be pointing your, your radio communication disk not only at the Earth but also at the Sun behind it. So typically you actually end up on an orbit which kind of oscillates around the Lagrange point. So the Herschel satellite was on quite a big orbit, kind of oscillating around, which actually kept it out of that exact line. So that's L1 in there, L2 out there. L3 is kind of the anti-Earth. It's kind of this, uh, uh, the other side of the solar system. And again, something here, again, you can see the net pull of the Earth and the Sun is all nicely lined up, which will keep it in an orbit basically following, uh, following the Earth around. 
There used to be lots of science fiction stories about L3. It used to be a popular place to put the anti-Earth, or you know, if you're an evil genius, that's where you put your hidden lair, because it was always hidden behind the sun as the two kind of orbit around each other. We've now had enough satellites out there that have actually looked at the other side of the solar system to know that actually there isn't anything much at L3. This isn't a point that scientists or astronomers have utilised for any reason? Not at all. I mean, it's quite hard to get there because it's kind of on the other side of the solar system. And of course, you would always have the sun between you and the Earth, which means that actually if you wanted to communicate with the Earth, it would be a bit of a pain. But if you wanted, for example, one hypothesised use for L3 is if you wanted to predict when there were solar storms coming around, it would be very useful to be able to look at kind of the far side of the sun, because then as the sun rotates around, anything that was going to be a big solar eruption or what have you, we would have kind of advanced warning because we'd be able to see it when it was on the far side of the sun rather than when it kind of sort of arrived on our side of the sun. Okay, so we've got L4 and L5. Now, they're the sort of slightly too subtle ones. L4 is over here, and L5 is over here. So if you look at L4, so this is the one that's sort of ahead of the Earth. So the Earth's coming around this way. This is, stays permanently ahead of the Earth. If you, again, if you think about the net pull of gravity, you get the pull of Sun that way, the pull of the Earth much weaker that way. The net effect is instead of being pulled directly towards the Sun, it's pulled a little bit that way. And so actually this, an object here actually orbits around a point somewhere around here rather than the centre of the Sun. Um, but actually that's what you want because in fact the Earth and the Sun are dancing around this point as well. It's the centre of gravity of the Earth-Sun system. So the Earth and the Sun, you tend to think of the Earth going around and the Sun stationary. Actually, they're not. The, the Sun's kind of doing its own little orbits as the Earth's going around this much bigger circle. They're both orbiting around this point. And now this, uh, something at this Lagrange point, this L4 point here, would also be orbiting around the same point. So again, it'll keep exactly in station. And just the same for the L5 point over here, that it's pulled towards exactly this point. These don't have much use in the Earth-Sun context, but actually, um, there are other pairs of objects you could think about, and one that people quite often look at is Jupiter and the Sun, because Jupiter is the biggest other body in the solar system. And if you think about Jupiter and the Sun as your two bodies, then actually there are a whole bunch of objects which are kind of trapped at the L4 and the L5 points. They're called Greek and Trojan asteroids. Generically, they're called Trojan asteroids. I don't quite understand why things would accumulate there, uh, but they don't accumulate at the Earth's L4 and L5. In principle, they could end up collecting at the Lagrange points for other planets as well, L4 and L5. They don't actually collect at L1, L2 and L3 because it turns out those orbits are actually unstable. So something, if you put something at say L2 and then just left it alone, it, over time it would drift away. The perturbations of the other planets and its own little motions would mean that over time it drifted away from that point. So it's called an unstable point. And in fact, if you want to put your satellite at L2, you actually have to have it actively controlled. You have to have rockets that kind of keep it there. Very, not very much, but just enough to kind of stop it from drifting away. Whereas L4 and L5 are actually stable points, which means that when stuff is there, it stays there. A little perturbation, it won't actually move away from the L4 or L5 point. Which means over time, stuff just kind of collects there, and once it's there, it stays there. And in fact, the Earth-Moon system has them as well. So there are Lagrange points for the Earth-Moon system, and people have started to find small bodies trapped at the Lagrange points, the L4 and the L5 points of the Earth-Moon system. So any pair of objects where in the region where those two objects are the sort of the dominant source of gravity, so in the case of the Earth-Moon system, sort of within the, the orbit of the Moon, um, you can find these Lagrange points and these, these kind of trapping effects occur. Some of the moons, I think, I can't remember if it's the moons of Saturn or Jupiter, but some of them actually have smaller moons trapped at their, their own Lagrange points around the planet and so on. So there's lots and lots of places the Lagrange points come up. spectacular object, but here we see what it looked like to astronomers of the day, and they didn't know what it was. So today we're at the Mercator Telescope on the island of La Palma. There you can see out to the bottom of La Palma in the ocean. You take a picture of a star cluster, you wait a decade or so, and then you take another picture and you see how far the stars have moved. 